Good morning, family. Good morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you here today. Um, I've really been enjoying this nice weather that we've been having. It's been really something that being able to get out and enjoy the beautiful, beautiful fall weather. It's just my favorite time of year. I, uh, we started a lesson in our uh, adult class on uh, Sunday nights and Wednesdays about, uh, about demons and ghosts and goblins and all of the things involving around Halloween and a lot of misconceptions about ghosts. A lot of misconceptions about goblins and things like that. And I really enjoyed my this lesson because, you know, it has to do with, with Scripture and and a lot of it, it, it exposes a lot of people's preconceived ideas about what the spirit world is all about. So I wanted to try to have a lesson to help fortify and go along with my Sunday night and Wednesday night lesson. Is there life after death? And I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want us to think about some of the things that you may think this is really a contradiction of, of terms, but something that we've got to look forward to one of these days. And I know God put in all of us the, 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 the drive to, to survive. And God did that for a reason because He wants us to prosper and, and propagate. And He wants us to uh, enjoy life. But, you know, there comes a time when we're all going to pass this life and we're going to go on. So, we all know that uh, we're all eventually going to die. Okay? And we know that. And whenever you talk about people or talk about death, boy, they just shudder and they just, a lot of times, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> and you know, things about what's going on are going to happen in people's lives. But the question is, what's going to happen? Or as Job puts it this way in Job chapter 14, verse 14, if someone dies, will they live again? And the days of my, of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. So, a man in his 80s one time told a friend that he is just waiting for the undertaker. And the friend asked, well, when the undertaker comes, where do you think you're going to be then? And the old man said, well, I'm going to be six foot underground. That's it. So, there's a lot of people think that, you know, Whenever they die, you know, they're dead all over like Rover and there's nothing else going to exist from that. Okay? So, we got to ask a question. Was this man right? Is this all that there is after death for us? Well, men has always hoped that uh, there is life after death. Robert Ingersoll, who was a noted agnostic of the 19th century, even hoped that there was life after death. And on his deathbed, although he was agnostic, on his deathbed, Ingersoll wanted to believe in heaven. When it really come right down to the very, very end of everything, he had to have, he wanted something to grab a hold of, to hope about. And we all believe that there is life after death. Do you not believe that? I believe that there is life after death. And we can believe that. But there's a lot of people today that really don't understand this. So the Bible answers beyond the shadow of a doubt, yes, we know that there is life after death. So what else does the Bible teach about what will happen to us after death? Well, first of all, to make this answer, to answer this just as clear and easy as I possibly can. Let me tell you a story about, old, named about a, a fictitious name about an old boy named Joe Brown, okay? We're going to talk about his life. We're going to talk about his death. And then we're going to talk about life after death, okay? And as we do so, let's keep in mind that old Joe represents every one of us who has lived in the past, who's living today, or who will be living in the future. And we're going to talk a little bit about this this morning. So, first of all, let's take old Joe Brown's life just for a little bit if he could. So, in Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, it says, What is a man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Okay? 
So we're all wondering about our lives. We're wondering about our bodies. We're running about our, wondering about life after death. We're wondering about our own selves while we're living. So in life, who is Job? Do you ever stop and think about that? Who are we in life? Okay. Now, first of all, Job has a spirit. Job has a spirit. Just like every one of us, we all have a spirit. That makes us who we are. We all have a spirit. And this is the most basic thing about old Joe, and it's the most basic thing about all of us human beings. We all have a spirit. Now, as we think about this just for a little bit, <coughs> in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit, and in truth. Now for us to be able to get to be with God, we gotta have a new glorious body. We gotta have a you know have a spiritual body. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this here in just a little bit. So therefore, man is more than just a body, okay? Man is more than just a shell. He is a spiritual being. Now we think scientists are really cocky, okay? They say, boy, can we do this? Can we do that? We can do all kinds of things. But they can't create life. Because the Spirit is the life. We think this a lot of times is an impossibility. Because a lot of times we don't understand the spiritual realm. We don't understand the Spirit of God. This is a most assured thing that the Spirit is who we are. A part of us. So, Paul speaks of the man being composed of two parts. There's the inner part, which is a spirit, and then there is the exterior part, that is the body, okay? So we think about this, the outer man. So, as we look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore, do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being nude day by day. Now, <clears throat> Jacqueline, we feel those hurts, don't we? <clears throat> many of us feel those hurts. We use those pains. I know I've been watching you walk around here crippling for many weeks now. But there's a day coming when we're all going to be put back together in a way that there's going to be no more hurts. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be blessed. It's something for us to look forward to one of these days. There's going to be no more cancers. There's going to be no more ulcers. There's going to be no more back bones and back pains and knee pains. Life is in heaven is going to be beautiful. So we're going to talk about this here in just a little bit. Also, we have a physical body. We have a spiritual body, but we also have a, spirit, a, a physical body. So we read, look at Job, what he has. A physical body, and we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God, mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, we're made up of two parts. We're made up of the spiritual, and we're made up of the carnal or the physical, okay? So, what is all this talking about? Well, Joe has also has a personality, okay? We have a personality. And we use these, the words personality for that person's spiritual makeup of who we are. And every one of your personalities are unique. Every one of our personalities are unique. I look at every one of you in here and there is no two people that has identically the same personality. You're beautiful, okay? You complement one another. God has put you together in a way that your personality identifies you who you are, okay? Now what's this got to do about life after death right here? Well, old Joe Brown, you know, he's... You look at this old Joe Brown, he has a, a, a personality that is made up of, he's either friendly or he's sour, <laughs> he's kind, 
or he's rude, he's humble, or he's arrogant. Okay? So that makes up who old Joe Brown is. Now, all of Joe's habits, his characteristics, his traits, makes up of what Joe is. Okay? Now, what kind of people are we today? Without those characteristics, oh, Joe ceases to be Joe. Without those characteristics, we cease, we cease to be us. So, we are uniquely made. And we have the ability to kindle or to change or make those characteristics about. We have a choice. Okay? So, we're either, a, we are spiritual, but we also have a carnal or a human body. Okay? And we also have a physical characteristics. We are people that has a decision that we can make. Okay? Now, let's look for a minute. Let's look at Ojo in death. Okay? Now, what happens when Ojo dies? Well, in James chapter 2 verse 26, As a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, for us to live... You got to have a spirit. <clears throat> Where did the spirit come from? <clears throat> Where did the spirit come from? Come from God. How do you know that? Huh? Ecclesiastes tells us that. Okay. This is a very precious spirit, uh, spirit uh, scripture. When God, God even knew you. God even knew you before you was ever born. God breathed that spirit of life in those in your the nostrils in your breath, breath of life within you. God knew you before. Now I think about this. We're not a we're not somebody that God does not know. God knows us. This is precious. So when the spirit leaves the body, then we know what happens to the body. What happens to the body? It dies. The body can't live without the spirit. And function, now we can put them on life supports. Nobody wants to live like that, do we? But I want you to think about this. A lot of people's dread in life because of what the future may bring. But I want to tell you something. For us Christians, we got something wonderful waiting for us. Amen? Don't ever forget it. So death is a picture of changing one's garments, okay? Taking off our earthly tent and putting on a, a new house, a new body, okay? A new existence. <coughs> to be clothed with Christ, our dwelling is to be in heaven. So question, who are we then? Well, just as a person is you, okay, let's, 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 think, let's think of this a minute, Okay? When somebody dies, they say, oh, they're gone. Okay? We'll never, they'll never exist again. There's a lot of people that feel that way. Well, let me ask you a question. I want you to think about our vets. And it gets blown up in these roadside bombs, okay? And they come back from over fighting and overseas, and they come back in their arms, and their limbs are all missing, their legs are all missing, and they're in wheelchairs, and they're still who they are. They come back crippled. Most of them say, don't, don't have pity on me. I'm still who I am. When we die, we are still who we are. We're just in a different place. We're in a better place. Let's never forget that. Even so, Joe Brown, when he dies, he takes off his earthly body, but he still continually exists. Where does he exist? So question, let's look at Joe Brown in Hades. Now who knows where Hades is? Who knows what Hades is? Okay. Huh? There's a thermos. Not necessarily. No. Who knows who else can tell me where Hades, what Hades is? Isn't the waiting place? A waiting place for who? For what? For sinners. For, for the dead. That's, that's a waiting place of the dead. So what happens immediately after Joe Brown's death? You know, well, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, okay, that's a good one that we can turn to. The rich man, you know, he gladly had everything really good going for him when he was living. 
you know, old Lazarus, you know, he, he was a beggar. He really didn't have a whole lot of nothing. Begged for the crumbs that fell from the table of the rich man. He wish he had something better in life. Well, let's read. In Luke chapter 16, verse 22-24. The kind of time come when the beggar died, and the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, in Hades, he was in torment. So, yeah, you're right. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in these fires. But Abraham replied, Well, some remember that your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received his bad things. But now he... Uh, uh, is uh, confronted here and uh, comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. <coughs> he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And in Luke, we go ahead and Abraham replied, Then they have Moses and the prophets, and let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they don't listen to the Moses and the prophet, they will not be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. Now, what are we talking about? From this we can learn first of what a, uh, what a person is after death, okay? After death, he is a spirit. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 2 through 4, Meanwhile, we groan and longing to be clothed and stead with our heavenly dwelling. Because we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and, and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, he also makes the same point when he answers his questions. How do the dead rise? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, 35, but someone will ask, well, how are the dead risen? What kind of bodies will they come from? Okay? And then he tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Okay? Now, what is a spiritual body? Well, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 53. So I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does a perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Hear that? In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the, impact, for the perishable must close itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. <clears throat> now, what are we talking about? Therefore, each one who has died will have a spiritual body. Now, we've already laid that out. A person still has his form of personality. We always already laid that out because, you know, the rich man and Lazarus you know, retain their personality. We read that, okay? They understood this. So from this story then, as we read right here, we learn when a, where a person goes after he dies, okay? The story is not talking about life after judgment because life's still going on while this story is happening, Okay? Because a rich man had five brothers who was still on the earth and he wanted to, Lazarus to go down and, and, and talk to them. Now, what do we learn about all of the people and where they go after death? Well, some like Lazarus goes to a place of rest. Okay? And we're going to talk about this. Hades. 
A lot of people don't understand this, but listen to it. This, so when some people go to, the, to a place of rest, this is called what? Paradise, okay? This is the characteristics of, of the Hadean world. We're going to look at this. Because according to what Jesus said, you remember when Jesus was being held upon the cross, nailed on the cross with two thieves with him? He says that this is where, you know, the thief would be. But that's where, you know, the the, the dead goes. Now look at this. Now, this is important. And this is where a lot of people get messed up. When you die, and your spirit leaves your body. It goes to be in Abraham's bosom in paradise. Okay? When the dead, when those who are, the spirit dies, if you have not been a good person and you're not found faithful in God, you go to torment. Now this is where the rich man went in torment. This is where Lazarus went. Okay? Now, when Lazarus was up here in paradise, he said, Oh, it's hot up here. I need some relief. Well, could you have him come and dip your fingers in the water and put them on the lift down here in torment? No, we can't do that. Why? Because there's a great gulf that separates us. Now, when we look at all of this, paradise is a part of the Hadean world. Because the Bible teaches that Jesus went there. Let's look at Acts chapter four, uh, 2, <clears throat> verse 31. It says, Seeing what was to come, He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that He was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did His body see decay. The Hadian world is the realm of the dead. Okay? Now, we look at all of these things and we understand that a lot of times people don't understand this. It's really basically simple. Others, like the rich man, goes through a place of torment. The rich man also said to be in Hades. Now, if we look at all of this and we think paradise and torment and an unseen realm or Shiloh or Hades, the Bible talks about that. So what are we discussing here? The time come when the beggar dies and the angels carried him to Abraham's side and the rich man died and he was buried. And in Hades, in verse 23, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his right side. Now, what is all this talking about? Well, okay, this brings a question we need to ask ourselves. How could both places, a place of comfort, a place of torment all be in Hades. Well, that's the place of the dead. Hades is a place where God has put that those that the spirits go until He calls the judgment day. Okay? In Hades is a place of the dead. Paradise is on one side and the great gulf separate him, separates it from torment. Now, how many of you knew that? A few hands going up. Some of well... Understand that, okay? How many times you ever sat at a funeral and somebody said, now when this person's dead, he's in heaven today. How many of you ever heard that? Huh? Everyone. Almost everyone. They are not in heaven. If you believe the Scriptures, why do they say that? They did not go through the final judgment. We, when people die, when, when we die, we are taken to paradise. Abraham's bosom. That's in the Hadean world. The Hadean world, a lot of people say, well, Hades, Hades that, that's hell. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a place of the dead. In the Hadean world, is paradise as well as a place of torment. And there is a great gulf that separates the two. Okay? And when judgment day comes, and we'll talk about that, God's going to pull all of those out and... You know, I don't want the body like that and change them and it's going to be judged, okay? So let's go on. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Okay, now, let's look at Joel's second coming of Christ, okay? Christ is coming again. We all believe that? Yep. I do. 
Men of Galilee, they said, in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In the clouds. It does not say that Jesus is going to come back and put his foot upon this earth. We will all, those who are alive, will be all drawn up from earth and drawn up in this clouds and be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? So according to the New Testament, there is nothing to prevent Jesus from coming back at any time. Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> boy, I'm glad to hear that. I am too. So question, what's going to happen when Christ returns? Okay? When Christ comes again, what's going to happen to old Joe? Well, he's going to be raised, okay? Now, wow, we know that in John 5, 28 through 29. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are, here, who are in their graves will hear his voice. And come out, those who have done what is good will be raised to live, and those who have done what is evil will raise to be condemned. Okay? So, the dead will be raised first, okay? We hear that. So the righteous and the unrighteous is also going to be raised apparently pretty much at the same time, okay? So when Christ comes again, those who are alive will be changed. Again, when Christ comes again, those who are alive will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Now, how do we know that? Well, look at this. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Wouldn't you like to see Jesus coming in the cloud with all of his angels with him someday? Knowing, okay? Behold, I tell you, your mystery, we will all not sleep, but we will be changed. At the last trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable, and they shall be changed. So, after the resurrection, old Joe will still have a body, but it will be a different kind of body, okay? It will be, among other things, imperishable. It will be spiritual to be able to get to heaven. Blood and, and our bodies cannot be able to get to heaven. Now let's read this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with by fire, and the earth and everything in it will all be laid bare. So it's all going to be burned up right here. Everything in the world, all the, all the trees, everything you know on the face of the earth, even the planets, the stars. Why do you think he's going to destroy all the planets and all the stars? Why do you think that? Here, stop thinking about that for a little bit. Reasonable deduction here. We got what we call a space race, okay? A space, uh, space endeavors. Where people want to go, who knows? We, if you, if, if, if the Lord kind of just destroyed the earth, what would keep, what, well, maybe there would be people on, uh, on the moon at that time. Might be on Mars. We're talking about going to Mars here in the next 10 years. You see God's wisdom? There's no holes in it. That's why God's going to burn everything up. Because every man that exists, no matter wherever he is, will end. So you're ready for that day to come? So let's look at Job in judgment. Okay. In Matthew chapter 25, 31 32. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people from the, one another, as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Several questions could be answered here about judgment. Who will be the judge? Who knows who's going to be the judge? Jesus Christ! He's going to separate anything that offends in the church. It's going to be judged, okay? Then he's going to take it and he's going to present it to God. So, Joe said, as we look at in Revelation 20, verse 13, John said, they were judged, everyone, according to their deeds. Now, like it or not, ready or not, we're all going to be judged by this scripture. There's an appointed appointment that every one of us is going to have to keep. So are you ready? Amen. So question, we're going to close here in just a second. Who's going to be judged then? 
Well, Acts 17, verse 31, 1, it says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And that's who? Jesus Christ. He has given proof of this to everyone who raised him from the dead. So question, what will be the basis for judgment then? Okay. Well, will we, we will be saved or lost just like the rich man in Lazarus was, okay, according to what we have done in this life. We will be judged by our deeds. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether we good or bad. So while we're living today, family, I want you to think about this. We are deciding right now, while we're living, we're making our choices where we're going to spend everlasting life. A lot of people think, well, God's going to determine that. No, we determine that while we're living right now. We're free moral agents. We decide whether we want to go to heaven or hell by the way we live. God even went so far as to send His only begotten Son to die for our sins. To help us to escape the, the terrible punishments that's awaiting those who rejected God and Jesus. So for old Joel and the rest of us, only two eternal places can, can exist. Either eternal life in heaven or hell. Now, I want, to, I want to close with what people think. And this is disturbing to a lot of people. Regardless of what people think, the Bible teaches that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. Okay? Now, some objects to the existence of hell. Some teaches that no, there's no such thing as hell today. Okay? Some teaches that well, hell is only momentary. <laughs> okay? That it's here, you go through it, you're gone, and you're on your way. Okay? But the Bible does not teach that. Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torments will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or anyone who receives the mark of his name. Anyone who follows Satan, or Satan's workers, are going to be tormented for eternity. So question, who knows what hell's like? Who knows what hell's like? Let me give you some things. I wrote it down right here. I want to I read them to you. And this is what the New Testament describes hell as like. A lake of fire in Revelation 20.15. A furnace of fire and a place of wailing. Matthew chapter 13, 42. A place of torments in Luke 16, 23. A place of outer darkness in Matthew 3, 12. A place where people will cry for mercy in Luke 16, 24. A place of everlasting punishment in Matthew 25, 46. A place prepared for the devil and its angels. Matthew 25, 41. And a place where one is tormented with brimstone in Revelation 21, 8. You don't know how to escape that? How do you do it? Huh? Come on, family. How do you escape that? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your spirit's going to go somewhere. It's either going to hell or it's going to go to hell. You can't kill the spirit. When God did it, you can't have it. It's going to exist forever. We're going to go to heaven, right? Why? Because we got the blood of Christ. Why? Because we was baptized in 
the blood of Christ, we are living faithful unto death. Amen? Amen. Don't look at death as something atrocious. You look at death as a new birth. That where we can have a place of beyond all imagination, paradise. And then comes the judgment and then we go to heaven, which is beyond paradise. Oh, how wonderful it is to be a Christian. And when people today are thinking Christianity is a joke, we're going to see whose joke's on whose. Okay? If there's anybody here today who's the prayers of the church, obey the gospel. If anybody here is not prepared for that judgment day, I urge you so strong with the bottom of my heart, be prepared. Whoever's listening to this lesson on our face page, church face page, if you're not prepared, I beg you, I beseech you, get it right now. Because time is running out. You don't know what tomorrow would bring.